everybody. Uh, as as the fine folks before me just said, my name is Seth Costner. I'm with a independent game studio called Better Scout Shenanigans. We are three brothers, and uh, I just want to take a moment to uh, announce that my young brother Sam just beat cancer last week. <laughs> Establish a little bit of credentials for those of you who don't know me, uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of a reason to maybe consider what I'm about to say. Although you're free to disregard everything, that's your prerogative. So I have uh, I've completed about 22 games since I started working on games in 2011. Ten of those jam games. Uh, three of those jam games were competition games, and I've published either 12 games or 12 versions of games. Uh, throughout, and I've accumulated over 5 million players with all the games that I've worked on. Most of those games have been better special shenanigans, so it's part of the three man team, so I've been a pretty uh, important part of the development process for all those things. And I've been in the designer role for every single game that I've worked on. Uh, and our next game coming up is called Crashlands. For those of you guys who haven't heard of it, it's a crazy, huge, uh, open world action crafting adventure game, story driven. Uh, probably about 60 or more hours of content we're looking at, and we're launching on January 21st on PC, Mac, iOS, and Android. And uh, we've also had the challenge with this game of doing cross-platform support, because we're doing the same game on all four platforms, and you can move your save from one place to the next. So that's been kind of an interesting technical challenge. Uh, and that's, that's where we are as a studio right now, doing a game on that and, well, uh, without a disclaimer, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, just because I've made a lot of games, it doesn't really, it doesn't really mean a lot. So the things that I'm going to be talking about in this talk are just coming from my experience. And other people may have had completely different experiences. Other people may be working on completely different games or game types. The types of games that we work on in Butterscotch are more conventional games. So think action -y games, RPGs, uh, adventure games, stuff like that. If you're into uh, heavily narrative-driven games, you know, think Gone Home style, or, or experimental games, or art games, uh, maybe the things in this talk won't apply to you. And that's okay. Uh, you know, games are it's a pretty broad field. So I just don't want you guys to think that I'm sweeping those things under the rug. And I'm just talking from my own experience. So. Okay. So the question that kind of came as the impetus for this talk was, was this question. Why is it that some games are good? Some games are good. Okay, how many of you guys have all played games? How many of you guys have played a bad game? Yeah, I mean, if you played a game, you probably play a bad game, right? Uh, and, you, and how many of you guys have played good games? Probably everybody, right? So it's this weird thing, right? It's like that uh, like the Supreme Court definition of porn. You know, you know when you see it, right? Like some games you just feel. Some games are good, you keep coming back, you keep playing it over and over again. Uh, and so I kind of started asking myself, why is it that why is it that some of these are good and some of these are bad? Is there some kind of a common thread that we can identify throughout all games? This is an uncomfortable question for us as game designers, because we like to think that the things we make are unique and special snowflakes, and nobody can apply a general question like this to every game and come up with an answer. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do for this topic. <laughs> uh, but in order to answer this question, uh, I think we have to ask a further question which is, what are games supposed to do? Because I think a bad game would be one that fails to do that thing. <laughs> a good game would be one that succeeds, right? And those of you guys who saw my Boots and Rockets talk uh, from a year and a half ago, this theme is going to become pretty familiar to you. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you should look it up on YouTube. So, uh, this is what games are supposed to do, in my opinion. And again, uh, this is based on the types of games that I make. Uh, so you may you're free to disagree, but I believe that games are essentially pride machines. They're these intricate sort of you know sets of interlocking parts that when a player interacts with it, they get presented with a series of challenges, and by overcoming those challenges, the player gets to feel pride. They get a sense of accomplishment, they get a sense of achievement, and that's really where the fun comes from. If somebody says they had fun playing a game, what I believe they mean is I was proud of myself when I played it. 
So this is this is a uh, graph of neutral psychology. It comes from a concept called flow. It's often used in things like talking about school and why some children succeed at school, why some kids fail. It's used in corporate America, uh, talking about you know, how to get the most out of your employees by challenging them properly. But interestingly, it, it translates really well into games because as game developers, what we do is we just present challenges to our players. So uh, let's take a look at what might be considered a bad game based on this. Based on this. In the example of horizontal axis, we have what we consider player skill. And by skill, I just mean the tools that the player has at their disposal to overcome challenges. That can be anything from knowledge to that sweet new epic piece of armor that they just got from the boss they just beat, uh, maybe some amount of planning, and yeah, things like fast twitch reflexes, you know, access to a good keyboard, whatever it is that the player has. And then on the vertical axis, we have uh, challenges. So of course, the higher up we go on the vertical, the more difficult the challenge. So this right here, this smattering of eight yellow dots, would be considered what I would consider to be probably a bad game, uh, because here the game is presenting eight challenges to the player, uh, where only two of them are actually appropriately engaged against what the player is capable of. So to the three up here in the top area. These are challenges that are above and beyond what the player can actually handle, and they're incapable of pulling that sense of pride from the game because they can't, they can't do it. So this, is, this is like a rage quit scene. Right? <laughs> uh, in the bottom right, we have the boring zone, which is things that you present to the player that are supposed to be challenges. They're so mind numbingly easy that the player feels about it. They can't be proud of themselves for doing something that they didn't even have to try to overcome. Right? Uh, and so, once again, no challenge, no pride, no fun. It's really have two things in this game that are actually sort of worth interacting with. This is a game that they're going to shut off. The cool thing about games is we make them up. Like they're completely imaginary. They don't even really exist. So, uh, so we, as the designer, we put all eight of these dots on exactly where they are. We decided that it's going to work like this. Which also means that we can make a decision to put on this. Everything in the game is completely malleable. It's like blocking right? You, know, you can shake parts off, you can put stuff on, you can move things around. You can change it however you want, right? And this is what we call that. Is moving those dots, you know, chain, adjusting the challenges so that the player feels really good about themselves because they're able to overcome the challenges in the game. So this is the definition that I'm going to work out for the talk. Uh, is that balancing is adjusting any element of the game to allow the player to gain a sense of pride from your activity. So this is cool. Right, how, many guys, how many guys are game developers or even just started making games? Okay, now how many of you guys, who just raise your hands, have worked on a bad game? Everybody's hand is still here. <laughs> if you've made a game, you've made a bad game. Um, that's just, just, uh, um, but that's okay, because I believe there's no such thing as an irreparably bad game. A bad game is simply a game that hasn't been balanced properly. It's just suffering from balance problems. Either it's too hard, or it's too boring, and the player doesn't have fun more play. That's what makes it a bad game. Right? Uh, so all we have to do is learn how to think about balance, think about every aspect of the game through the lens of balance, and it simplifies things immensely. And then we can turn a bad game into a very good game. I'm sure some of you guys have played games that over time, through a series of patches or something, became better. Uh, which, to me, that's also a also balance. It's just from the bottom. So how are you going to do that? I mean, it's easy for me to just show you a stupid graph with yellow dots on it and go, just move the dots into the function. Uh, that's not really helpful for you guys. And so, uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that, how to identify how to move those dots. This is through a mechanism that we're calling balance level, which I think I think I made up. And I'm <laughs> if you Google that term, you just get a bunch of physics crap. So uh, anyway, balance lever is just simply it's a thing that you can adjust to change the way that the player experiences the game. And the way the reason I call it a lever is because it typically tends to go one way or the other. If you, for example, take a particular variable, maybe player movement speed or something, and you increase it, it's going to make some things easier. 
right? And if you decrease it, it's going to make those same things hard. So you just you turn it one way or the other, and it's going to change the way the player experiences things. So how do they use balance letters? How do you identify them? How do you apply them? The first step is to know what your problem is in the game, which we'll handle that a little bit later, so you guys can just take it on faith. That right now, you just made a game where the enemies are too hard, okay? I'm just going to put that out there for you. Uh, so here's the problem. The enemies are too hard. What do you do? Make a list. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that once you do it enough, it will become intuitive. You won't need to manually go through this process and consciously pull through all these things once you have done this a lot. Uh, but it's super helpful for an early gameplay. Uh, just enumerate all of the possible things that might contribute to this being a problem. So let's say the, the hypothetical imaginary game that you guys just made. Uh, has these things. These are all the things that you have come up with that might contribute to enemies being too hard. Uh, enemy damage and player health. That's two sides of the same coin. Uh, if you increase player health, then enemy damage feels lower, right? And vice versa. Uh, we have enemy attack speed. So that has to do with actual sort of reaction times for the player. If the enemy attacks super fast, players with slower reaction times are going to have a hard time. Uh, number of enemies. Maybe it's the case that enemies individually are fine. If you're just throwing way too many of them at the player. Uh, that's also a possibility. And then you've got player move speed. Maybe the player is moving so fast that they're just slamming into enemies and just hurting themselves and they can't control it. Or maybe they're moving so slowly that they can't react to what the enemies are doing. Either way, it's up to you to kind of make the call. Uh, so what do you do? So you've listed all these things. Now, as, a, as an early game developer, one thing you might do is go through all of them. So we'll say enemies are too hard, what are we going to do? Well, let's uh, reduce enemy damage, increase player health, let's reduce the enemy attack speed as well, just for good measure. Maybe have half as many enemies, make the player work faster. What have, you, what have you just done? If you do all five of these things, what have you just done? You just broke the shit out of the game. It doesn't even work anymore. Uh, so that's. Uh, golden rule number one of balance. Apply one solution to one problem. Don't apply five solutions to the same problem. Try to find something that will fix it, tweak that one thing, and just kind of see what happens. Uh, so my point here is uh, think through the implications of adjusting each of these elements in isolation. In isolation is the key aspect of this. Uh, and also it kind of depends on what you want to go for with game feedback. So if you have a game that has a lot to do with, say, like grinding to get better armor and weapons or something like that, and it's all stats-based, maybe like a turn-based RPG or something, um, then enemy damage, player HP, those are really important because that kind of jives with the feel of your game. But if you want a fast twitch, skill-based game, maybe increasing player speed is what you want. So then it depends on the player to react to things. So once you've thought through these things, um, it's up to you as the designer to try to figure out which one sort of jives with your vision of the game and change that one thing. I'm serious, just the one thing. Don't touch anything else. Uh, tweak it, play it, see how it feels, and see if you're seeing the problem solved. And if not, maybe just tweak that same thing. Even a little bit. All right, so that's how you deal with sort of small things. So as you were kind of looking at that like, graph, you know, you little yellow dots on it. This is how you deal with sort of individual small problems. Uh, but it it's, would be kind of naive for me to say that any problem in a game is just kind of an isolated thing, because a game is a really complicated ecosystem. There's a whole bunch of stuff happening, just about anything can affect what the player is doing or thinking at any given time, right? So this is what uh, we're going to call the balance ecosystem. This is all the things in the game that are sort of global across the whole game that might actually damn with the player's experience or improve the player's experience. Uh, so what I would kind of, the way I would kind of approach these is, let's, let's just take a look at the graph. Graph. All right, so let's say you have this situation. You've got these, what is this, five, five core elements, five core challenges in your game. And they're all just a bit too frustrating, okay? And you're early in development, so you haven't really finished a lot of stuff in your game. Maybe you don't have a tutorial or your UI is kind of weird. 
uh, and whatever. But you put them in the hands of players, and universally your players are stupid. They're kind of frustrating. These are just two cards in this game. So what you could do is individually go in and find the balance levers for each of these dots and ship the whole thing over. Okay? Uh, you could do that. But then when you go through and you start finishing the game, and you polish it up, and you add sounds, and you add music, and you add all this other stuff, what you might find is that the dots have moved again. Everything has moved. Uh, that's because you're, you're now starting to, to play around with global systems that affect the entire game as a whole. And that's going to actually affect where all of these challenges lie. So I'm gonna kinda, just to kinda illustrate how this works. We're gonna go through just a couple of examples of things that are going, that will actually affect the game balance that you would probably never think of as being core aspects of game balance. All right, field of view. So this is just, to put it more simply, how far in the camera is zoomed. This can actually dramatically affect the balance of your game. Uh, so here at the top we have a slow-paced puzzle game called And Yet It Moves. Uh, in this game, you kind of just slowly scrapes along and you jump, it's like this really slow plotting thing and gravity's very low. And you play the game by rotating the world around your character. You just try to find the exit to different things. Uh, very slow. At the bottom, we have Super Meat Boy, which is uh, probably one of the faster, if not fastest, action platformers out there. You know, each level takes a matter of 10 seconds and you die 400 times. <laughs> uh, notice how big the characters are in each of these. You know, the one we've got, whatever, that paper guy, I don't know what his name is. He's, uh, he's a, a full fifth of the vertical space of the camera. And Meat Boy is only 3%. This allows Super Meat Boy to move really, really fast. Because you can, as a player, you can just see a lot more stuff. You can see things flying in off screen, you can see obstacles coming, and it just allows the gameplay to be super, super fast. So imagine trying to play Super Meat Boy zoomed in as far as in your movies. That's a really hard game, honestly. Probably impossible. Uh, and since balance is really all about just player skill versus difficulty and challenge, you haven't really affected the challenge too much, but you've inadvertently made the player really bad at the game because they can't see anything, right? So you've created a balance problem by zooming in your camera too far. Uh, so we have, oftentimes I get questions from people about how many pixels tall their character should be in the platform or something. And the question that I should respond with is how, how tall is your view? You know, could, because it all depends on how fast things are moving. Uh, pixels are irrelevant. What matters is the percentage of the screen space that the character has. Artwork. How many of you guys are artists? So what you guys do can break the game or make it awesome, right? Uh, you know, as artists often get kind of, uh, you know, they, they, they are often sort of on the sides of design discussions and stuff like that. They're just supposed to make things look great. Uh, but it's actually the case that artists are integral in making sure that the game is properly balanced. So here we have the crash lands, which is our game coming up January 1st on PC Mac and <laughs> This is a Gertzberg shirk attacking the character. Uh, and all the creatures in crash lands broadcast this red telegraph on the ground. So we have all these different shapes of attack patterns that the, that the enemies are about to do to hurt you. And it's your job to not be standing in that thing when the attack lands. <laughs> it's a pretty simple system, it's easy to understand. Um, but what happens if we change the environment? Yeah, that sucks, right? <laughs> now we have red enemies shooting red projectiles at you on reddish orange ground with red telegraphs telling you where the uh, damage is going. So these Vava creatures that are vomiting artillery tentacles at you uh, are going to be much more difficult only because you can't see them. And if we went ahead and, and uh, you know, sort of were like, okay, vomits are too hard, people are complaining about how hard these enemies are, if we went in and kept adjusting these enemies independently without fixing the art problem that we have, which is things are the wrong color, uh, if we didn't fix that, then by the time we do get around to fixing the art thing, our vomits are broken. So 
uh, it's important to you know, make sure that your art is where you want it before you start making changes based on things like this. Use your interface. I don't know what. <laughs> uh, I just Google bad game interfaces. <laughs> this transport typing, I don't know, I think it's possible. Um, so the user interface is something, it's a tool that the player uses to interact with. If you give the player a bad tool, then you make the player bad at doing things. I mean, it's, it's a pretty straightforward one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, and so when you think about that graph, right, where you have challenge on one and the player skill on the other, by putting together a really confusing and hard to understand interface, you are reducing player skill for every challenge that they face. Things may take longer to just even understand. They may not even be able to figure out what a challenge is or how to deal with it. So you're just making everything way harder. Than it is. So once again, uh, by putting together a really clunky, awkward interface, you've created a balance problem. The game is too hard. When you get around to fixing the interface, all those balance changes you made independently on the way are now going to be totally out of the way. So fix your interface first uh, before you go ahead and fix other balance problems that might be Oh, a nice goal for for interface stuff is try to show the player only what they need to know when they need to know it. No more, no less. I don't know. I don't know if that's the case on this. But <laughs> <laughs> Tutorials kind of goes in the same line as interfaces. Uh, this is a uh, Be Dangerous. I just picked that up on Steam. Their tutorial section it, it links you to a series of YouTube videos of the developers playing your game and telling you how it works. Uh, <laughs> worst ever. Um, so tutorials give the player the tools that they need in order to deal with the challenges that your game is going to. If you don't teach the player what to do, the game is way hard. For absolutely no reason. Uh, and on the flip side, if you if you have a tutorial but that teaches things incorrectly, that's even worse. Uh, so it becomes a it becomes a weird challenge where if you put your game in the hands of a player, you say, okay, so I have I have enough tutorial yet, but here's what you do, and you try to just kind of like walk them through it or something. Uh, you're going to end up with some things being way more complicated than they need to be, and the player's going to have harder time understanding things. You're going to end up making balance decisions based on that player's feedback, and it's just going to be wrong. So try to make sure that your game does an excellent job of teaching the player what to do. Uh, introduce game mechanics one at a time if you can, and just keep things on a good pace. Juice. Feedback. This is from a game called Road Force. Uh, character's gun, leg is a gun, I think. I think that's, I don't know, I hope, I hope that's what's happening, yeah. Um, okay, so I want you guys to use your imaginations. And imagine you are playing a shooter game where uh, you aim your weapon at an enemy and you click on the mouse, which is of course the fire button. And there is no muzzle flash, there's no recoil, there's no sound effect, there's no screen flash. You don't see a bullet impact, but the enemy falls over. Okay? Did you do that? Was that you? <laughs> you don't know, right? Uh, juice is really, really important in making sure that the player understands the consequences of their actions. It makes it really difficult for the player to extract that sense of pride for the things that they've done if they don't even know that they were the one that did it. Okay? Uh, so by not having this you know, high level of feedback in the game, these cool, you know, particle effects. And you can even implement some simple things just so that there's enough that the player kind of gets a sense of what they're doing. Uh, but without these things, the player can't take ownership of their actions, and it makes them feel internally, it makes them feel worse at the game than they actually are, because they don't even know whether or not they're making any difference. Uh, so this is this really bothers me sometimes. Companies who are working on a game will say, "Oh, well, we've just entered the polish stage." where we are now adding this kind of stuff. Now that we're three weeks away from launch, we're gonna put these things into the game. Uh, we have you know, cool particle effects and explosions and screen shake and gun recoil and whatever. Uh, that's a problem, because that game is gonna ship now feeling way different than it did three weeks prior. And any balance decisions that they made leading up to that point might have actually been wrong, because the player feedback is based on having no understanding of what their, what their actions are. <laughs> <laughs> I had a hard time finding an image for this. So. 
There you go. That's for that. Um, balance actually can begin outside of your game. Uh, so you know, think back on the graph. We have player skill on the horizontal axis and challenge on the vertical axis. Player skill is is dependent on the player, right? And so if the wrong people play your game, they're going to have a worse time. Uh, so just as an example, let's say you're launching a game on Steam, and it is the most brutal, Dark Souls-esque, bullet hell, Contra-style action platformer, full of blood and gore. It's just, it's just awful, okay? So you've made this thing for the most hardcore of the hardcore. And for the trailer, because you want to be mysterious for some reason, all you do is you put sort of a, a little cinematic where there's a person standing there, a beautiful sunset, some piano music, their hair is blowing in the breeze, uh, and that's it. Super indie trailer. People are going to see that go. You know, Story-driven games, narrative, <laughs> puzzle game. I don't know. They're going to jump into your game, and they're just going to get crushed because they had no clue what they were walking into, and you just lured in the entire wrong batch of people. Okay. So maybe your game is balanced for people who are looking for that kind of a challenge, but you just put the wrong group of people into your game, and you're going to get a ton of terrible reviews. Uh, and so you've weirdly created a balance problem by not even touching anything. Exactly. So uh, this is kind of a weird kind of kind of aside, but it's really important to think about the way that you are talking and uh, talking about presenting your game. So that you don't end up with people thinking your game is out of balance when really it's, it's just not for them. These can sound, I mean, if you use it sound people. Uh, so you guys are pretty crucial to ensuring that the game is balanced, whether you do it or not. Uh, so I'm going to use another shooter example because they're super brave and it's not easy to use it. Uh, let's say you are, uh, let's say you're walking across a field in some uh, battlefield or something. And, uh, all of a sudden, you are dead. Okay? That's the scenario. That sucks. What happens? You don't know, right? Now imagine the same scenario. You're walking across that same field. You hear some gunshots popping. Okay? You duck behind a rock. You are now not dead because you heard something that alerted you to what was about to happen. Sound effects are really important player's toolkit for dealing with challenges because it gives them an extra layer of feedback as to what's happening. If you neglect those until the very end, um, even just placeholder some of the things would do. You know, uh, but if you neglect those, then you are making the game much harder for people. And weirdly, you are creating balance problems because players can't figure out what's going on. Uh, music, same way. So imagine you walk into a room and all of a sudden, the normal game music cuts out and crazy drum beats start. The music gets super intense, right? What's about to happen? Something important, right? I mean, you're about to probably get the crap kicked out of you, but you know, you know that that's coming. Maybe you can pop up in your inventory and equip a grenade or, you know, whatever, whatever it is that you do in the situation. Uh, but if instead you walk into that room and just without warning, something crazy just burst through the wall and started kicking the crap out of you. You wouldn't have had a moment to prepare, and you would feel like that was unfair. So just by having two seconds of a music change, you can put the player into a better frame of mind to deal with the challenges coming. And in, a, in kind of a weird, roundabout way, you've actually increased the player's skill level for dealing with that challenge, just by giving them a little bit of advantage. OK, so that's all. there's a whole bunch more than that. Um, but I think the, the core message that I want to you get across with this is every single system in the game can affect balance. And by balance, I just, of course, I just mean how the player's perceived skill matches with the perceived challenge that the game is presented to them. So as you are making decisions about how hard enemies should hit, how things should behave in the game, be sure that, that these types of game systems are working closely to where you want them to be before you start making fine changes. So by the time you get around to actually hooking these things up, adding a tutorial, putting music in, getting sound effects, it's just going to change the whole game experience, and you're going to redo all of those small balance changes that you did earlier. All right, let's say you've got a balance problem, and you've gone through all your balance levers, you've tweaked a whole bunch of things, you keep putting it in the hands of players, it just doesn't work. 
nothing you do makes this thing better. Uh, and so you think, maybe I have an <coughs> ecosystem problem. So you fix your UI, you add a tutorial, you try to explain better, make things more clear, give it some feedback, give it some juice, it still sucks. Okay. <laughs> this, this happens. Uh, this is often the case of, you know, maybe you had some predefined vision for the game, there's a particular aspect of the game, and you're really gung-ho about that, and you keep trying to shoehorn it in there, and it just doesn't go. Well, that's okay, we have a solution to that. <laughs> give up. Uh, just ditch that aspect. It's okay. Uh, when you put the game in the hands of a player, they're not going to care about the things that you cut out of the game. All they care about is the stuff that they can play with at the end. And that stuff that is remaining has to be awesome. It has to be fun, it has to be engaging, it has to be appropriate and challenging. So if something isn't working, don't worry about it, just cut it out. <laughs> As an example, uh, so Crash Dance is a crafting-based uh, adventure game, a lot of exploration, a lot of sort of going out in the world, cutting down resources and stuff, and then building, and building up the mountains and new things, all that stuff. Uh, when we first made Crash Dance, we had a finite inventory system. Why? Because every crafting game has one of those, and we just didn't think about it. So we started with a 20 slot bag that you had, where you could put your stuff in. And whenever you went to craft things, the components came out of that bag, and the resulting output went into that bag. Okay? Once we had about 200 unique items in the game, that 20 slot bag really started to suck. <laughs> We ended up with this where, for starters, uh, the, the longer you played the game, the more of your gameplay was spent in menus. You would just be in your bag, moving things around. We had a really elaborate system of chests where you could build these sort of like boxes to keep your stuff in. You could label them and you know, keep your stuff organized. Uh, but eventually, it really just kind of cheapened the game experience because you weren't adventuring, you weren't doing quests, you weren't doing anything other than just moving stuff around. It made crafting frustrating. Uh, maybe you did have enough logs to make something, but you have 30 chests over here. Which one of them has the logs that you need to make the thing? I don't know. Time to start digging. That sucks. <laughs> uh, and then we had adventure. You know, going out into the world, collecting materials. Uh, I'm sorry. It's been two minutes, your bag is full. Time to go back to your base and ditch all your stuff into a chest. All of these things came from the inventory system being limited, and it was just a disaster. Uh, so what we did is we just ripped it out. We just thought, what if you just had an infinite inventory, and you never had to move things around in your bag, you never had to put a chest, you never had to worry about where you put your logs. And uh, so we started with that, and we eventually had to reimagine several of the game systems to accommodate it. Uh, but it made for a much better game. So, uh, you know, the inventory, which was originally the core part of the game, turned out to be the worst part of the game. We just ripped it out. Sam read it in my This is It's a dark problem. Yeah, it's an art problem. All right. So you may recall at the beginning, uh, I said that you would just take my word on that first one about what the problem was, which was that your enemies were too hard. So how do you actually identify what problems are in your games? Well, the easiest way is to put your game in the hands of the player. Someone who isn't your friend, hopefully, <laughs> or if they are your friend, they're honest. Uh, friends tend to be really polite about things, and it doesn't help. Uh, and if you put the game, if you put your game into the hands of a player, you will get pages and pages of complaints, which is what you want, right? You want to know all things that are wrong with your game because, uh, as we covered at the beginning, everything in the game can be changed. So you want your game to be the best game it can be, and as much as it hurts to put something you made into someone's hand and have them just, just destroy it for you. <laughs> Um, it's what needs to happen for you to make something good. So, this does come with one important, uh, I guess, an asterisk. Caveat. Caveat. Is that French? Caveat. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen for player feedback about a particular aspect of your game, but you don't have to listen to the feedback. Okay? 
Uh, that's because players are really, really good at one thing, which is miss one. This is a, this is a psychological phenomenon. And actually, I, I should I should think about the players of games. Human beings in general are super good at this particular thing, <laughs> which is the act or condition of wanting something with the mistaken belief that it will bring one happiness. <laughs> uh, as Gary Newman, the creator of Gary's Mod, and Rust puts it, players are useful at conveying a mood and a feeling. They're not game designers. Their ideas generally involve making it so they can win at the game. Okay. Uh, and, and if you, you know, plot out a player's balanced suggestions on that graph, almost all of them will land in four. They want to one-shot everything. They want to have God. They want free of every resource, they want infinite everything, and they will be done with that game in one and a half minutes. That's super boring for them, but they they think they want it. So as a game designer, it's our job to throw challenges in front of a player, which is another way of saying it's our job to, to throw sort of obstacles in their way. It's our job to make them miserable, right? <laughs> like we put stuff in their way that they hate, and then they beat the crap out of it, and then they feel great about it, right? Uh, and so it's your job to know your players better than they know themselves. And when they ask for things to be easier, you need to know when to say no. Okay. Here's a great example. Uh, this game called Borderlands yeah. by Gearbox. And there's a place in Borderlands called Skag Gully. It's a gully filled with skags. <laughs> <laughs> skags are kind of these weird alien dogs. You can't see one from there. Side. Uh, when they entered beta with the borderlands, they got this one point of feedback about skag from many, many things. There's too many skags. Skag, which, you know, it's kind of a point of skag right? uh, But this just came up time and time again. And so, you guys, the gearbox had potentially a balance problem with hands, right? So, what do you do? Well, let's see what we can, let's see what levers we can tweak to maybe address this particular balance problem. Our players are complaining about it, it's a problem. I guess we could reduce the number of skags, right? I mean, that's, that's a complaint in the form of a suggestion. There are too many skags, suggestion, re reduce the number of skags. <laughs> uh, you can also increase player boot speed. This is gonna mess with your ecosystem, right? That's gonna propagate across the whole game. If it's just a skag gully problem, why make the player move faster? You know, maybe maybe they'll be able to more easily get away from the skags and skag gully, and therefore the skags will be a problem. But now the player is moving fast everywhere. This changes everything. So that's not ideal. Reduce the health and or damage of skags. Maybe there's not too many skags. Maybe each skag is just too much of a hassle to deal with. So what if we just made skags a little bit easier? Once again, though, skags are present everywhere. So this is a big sweeping change that's going to break everything in the game. And it's, you know, maybe it'll fix skag gully, but now you got to go back and rework everything else. Uh, so what they settled on was dealing with the number of skags this game. So they tripled. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of my favorite games I'm doing. Let's see the player feedback. And the complaints stopped, which was awesome. It wasn't, and it's not like a mafia has like every time you guys complain about skags, you get <laughs> uh, it was it was a framing problem. Every time the players would go in skag gully, there were actually so few skags. The players spent most of their time just walking unimpeded through the zone, and players perceived the area as a simple pass-through travel zone. Maybe 10% of the time, a skag would run up and they would have to deal with that, and it was just annoying. Uh, so by tripling the number of skags and redoing the distribution of the skags, Gearbox made it so that as soon as you set foot in a skag building, you know you're in a skag building. Okay? <laughs> you are battling skags nonstop from the moment you set foot in there to the moment you get to the other side. And suddenly, it didn't feel like there were too many skags because the whole point of going into skag building in the player's mind became to fight a lot of skags. And now it's fine. I ain't not about to move the game. So this is a great example of a developer listening to player feedback about a particular thing, 
but not necessarily uh, doing what the players were asking for finding the correct solution. I also want to say, it also would have been a correct solution to reduce the number of scans. It would have been fine either way because it would have solved the problem both ways. It depended on what they wanted their vision of the game to be. Borderlands is a game about shooting lots of stuff. So which, which, which one would have been probably better? Probably having more things to shoot would have been the appropriate thing to do. Right? At the same time, reducing the number of scags would probably have also solved the problem. Alright, so what did you do? Um, it's kind of hard to make, you know, make that kind of ballsy move that, that Gearbox did. Um, so what do you do when you can play? So let's say, let's say you've made a game. That game has some enemies in it, some combat. It's just a basic kind of action game. And you put it in the hands of a whole bunch of players. And here are five recurring complaints that you can make. Enemies are hitting too hard. Uh, healing items are too weak. Enemy damage is hard to avoid, dodge moves are too slow, and the enemies are hitting way too fast. Okay? So these are five completely different things that your players are saying. As you may recall, at the very beginning we talked about applying one solution to one problem. Uh, we talked about balance levers. The same thing applies to this, because the way I see it, all five of these complaints are the same problem. If you were to go through and address each of these completely independently and just do what your players are suggesting, you would once again break the shield. Reduce enemy damage, buff healing items, make enemy damage easy to avoid, buff dodging, slow down enemy attacks, and just ruin it. So try to consolidate your feedback. That, that's the best piece of advice I can give when you're getting player feedback. Because now you have a singular problem, and once you figure out the balance levers associated with that, you can tweak one of them, and the problem is solved. So even though this is an A problem, which is that players are frustrated with fighting enemies, something about enemies is too hard. It could be any one of these five things. Or maybe it's none of them if you're making Dark Souls, and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you. That's okay. Uh, yeah, so just consolidate the complaints into similar categories of problems and address these problems one at a time with one solution at a time. Okay, so this is what I'm going to end on, which is there's no such thing as uh, a game that is great for everyone. There's no such thing as a game that's even good for everyone. If you have a game where 10% of your player base hates it, that's awesome. Like you're doing great. <laughs> because it's just not for everyone. You know, every player is completely unique, and although you can do a lot of things to empower the player to meet the challenges that your game provides, it's still up to them. You know, a game is a meeting between the player and the game, and they have to bring something to the table as well, and not everybody brings the same thing. So you can try to avoid that kind of problem, you know, with your framing and your marketing and stuff like that, the way that you talk about it, try to make sure you're the right people. But at the end of the day, you can only do so much. So uh, don't be heartbroken if you make a game that you're super proud of, that a lot of people are really excited about, and still there's a group of people who hate it. That's fine. I mean, people hate all kinds of things. It doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, and I'll just throw on here a quick recap of everything. I'm not going to read through or anything, uh, but I just wanted to open up the Q&A. And I'll just put these on screen so those of you who are kind of taking notes or whatever, you can uh, just get these things down. Okay, that's it. Yeah. So when thinking about balance numbers, yeah, how do you deal with, or at least how do you? foresee the casting effect, slightly up player HP, because enemies are too hard, but now our potions are No, what? Our potions are weak, our health potions. So how do you, how do you, like obviously that's going to happen, but how do you manage that across your game once the casting effect of the balance of those? Uh, well, in that case, you may want to just mess with energy damage. Right. 
Um, I think it's generally a good practice to make sure that most of your things cascade in different ways, but in ways that are controllable. Um, so for example, one thing that we do in Crashlands is as the player increases in level, there's a single formula that dictates what the player's HP is going to be at a given level. Enemy HP is based off of that same formula. Player damage is based off of the enemy HP formula, and so on and so forth. So uh, if we ever change one thing, it's still going to propagate throughout the whole game and everything's still going to be perfectly even. And so all we got to do then to sort of interfere with that formula is there's always these kind of like middleman calculations, right? So like what percentage of player HP is the enemy HP, right? So if we just tweak that number, we can fix that number. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll kind of depend on how you have things set up. You want to definitely go with whatever's the most surgical option. Like whichever thing is going to have the least impact beyond the particular problem that you're trying to solve, that's the thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so I know you said you were applying this specifically to like your experience, like the type of game you play. Yeah. Um, but how would you uh, apply some of this to say like like a strictly PvP competitive sort of game, where uh, most of you know the, the challenge is based on the other you know other places? Well, you have a good match. Start. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, no, I can't speak too much to that because uh, I have never made a play versus player game, so I won't speak out of turn on that. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's much more messy because the challenge that is being presented to a player is the skill of getting players, right? So uh, as a kind of an example of sort of matchmaking gone wrong, uh, have you guys ever heard of Tribes Ascend? Yeah. Okay, so Tribes Ascend had a level up system. The level up system was purely indicative of how much time you spent playing the game. So you were level 8 by the time you'd spent like 2 hours or 3 hours in the game. But if you were level 50, you had like 40,000, I don't know, like an entire lifetime. Um, but their matchmaking system only had two brackets. It was people at level 8 and below, and everyone's. So, uh, as an example of sort of matchmaking gone all the way wrong, you know, as soon as you hit level 9, you find that all of a sudden, everyone is just really <laughs> <laughs> uh, It's miserable, and if you, don't, if you don't sort of internalize what's happening, and why it is that all of a sudden you are just the worst person on earth in your life, you don't figure out that it's just because you're in a different bracket. That's super frustrating, and you're going to quit, right? Um, so that would probably be my suggestion for your number one priority, is making sure, absolutely, that you're matching up the right people. Uh, I actually know of a, a recent example of probably doing it the right way, that you would probably be doing it, I guess. Sure. Uh, which is uh, Rising Thunder, which is a new fighting game that's trying to make fighting games accessible and stuff. And uh, it has like a ranking system, uh, that's visible to you, that is sort of based on your rank, but not really. That's like it goes up faster than it goes down and stuff. So it's more like based on your time. And then the developers wrote an article that they basically said, yeah, we can completely ignore that, and then we have your, an actual ranking system that's getting right. <laughs> Good. Yeah, that's what I <laughs> yeah. so, okay. uh, um, If you can find a solution to a specific balance of problem or a set of people in the future, uh, but you shouldn't be doing it. Right, right. <laughs> um, is it valid to just spread out possible solutions among the like across the world? Yeah, I mean, we generally refer to those generally as shins. It's like you can you can find all kinds of things that might prop up a broken system for a while. Uh, for us, you know, for our for our inventory problem, the short term solution was just keep making the bag bigger. Eventually, we had a 100 slot bag and we had to scroll for days to find the bottom of them. Uh, at the same time, it doesn't solve the problem of having to dig through the dang thing. Um, so, you can, you can do some short term things, and maybe it'll work based on sort of the timeline of how long people are going to be playing your game. Maybe that solution you find, uh, although temporary, it might last long enough for most people that it doesn't matter. Uh, but yeah, if you do have something that's a really big problem, 
it's important to ask yourself why that thing is there, and whether it really has to be. And if not, you know, then, and it's, sometimes it's really hard to think about. So our, the reason we had the inventory system to begin with in Crashlands was because every other game had one. And we didn't, we couldn't conceive of a crafting game that didn't have it. Uh, and it took a whole year of development before we were like, hey, this is just awful. Uh, so try to think outside the box. Of it.